Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk ETC. I have a special guest with me, Mick Kimani of Chama Pesa, is going to share a little bit about blockchains in Africa, past, present, and future, and all the excitement and drama going on there. So uh, welcome, Mick, to the show. Thank you, Christian, for reaching out over Skype and for having me on your show. Yes. Yeah, so the first I, time on a podcast. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, I know a little bit of the excitement and drama of BitPesa and some other things going on in Africa. But before we get to that, why don't you share a little bit about yourself so the audience knows your background and what Chama Pesa is and other things about you? Okay. Uh, so... First of all, I'd like to say Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and just the whole movement uh, literally changed my life. Uh -huh. So I first found out about Bitcoin uh, when I was in, at university. Uh, I was studying electronic and computer engineering. Uh -huh. uh, that was in 2011, and I took a two-year sabbatical. I took a break from school uh, to just figure out my life and what i wanted to do uh -huh. um and while while i was on my sabbatical i was listening to this show it was a a radio show on uh, bbc world service and uh his name is peter day and he had this guest on and they were talking about uh, virtual worlds and uh, virtual realities and in between the sort of uh, brought in the subject of uh, virtual currencies uh, like Linden dollars and uh, and Bitcoin. So th that was the first time I heard about Bitcoin. Uh -huh. And I remember going up to my phone and, and just Googling and trying to see what, what was this Bitcoin thing. Uh, but then I, I kind of forgot about it until later on when I heard the price had gone up to around $200. This was uh, a year later. Uh, so naturally I wanted to, like, how do I get some Bitcoin, you know, uh, I'm in Nairobi, I'm in Kenya, so I'm Googling, I'm trying to see where can I buy Bitcoins in Kenya, where can I buy Bitcoins in Nairobi, where can I even buy Bitcoins in, in Africa, uh, and at that time, the, the only option that was available was in South Africa, you sort of had to send a wire transfer, so uh, I quickly gave up. Mm -hmm. uh, until a year later in 2013 when I saw the price go up to about $700. And, and this time I was, I was so lucky because there was some early activity on local Bitcoins, which is like a peer-to-peer -peer website. And that's when I bought my first Bitcoin in 2013. I remember it was 2013, November, and the price was about $650. So uh, when, I, when I went back to school after my sabbatical, uh, and completed my degree. Uh, I joined a prop trading firm for about three, four months. Uh, I was trading derivatives, but I was always distracted. Yeah, in fact, my boss used to hold me because I was always looking at, I was always reading Bitcoin material when, when I'm supposed to be working. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, at the same time, there was like a, a community that was building up in Nairobi. So this was in 2014. And there were about two companies that had established themselves in Kenya. One of them was Big Pesa, and the other, the other one was uh, Kipochi. And uh, these two companies kind of built the same product. And the product was converting cryptocurrency into your local currency and converting your local currency into Bitcoin. Right. using what's called a mobile wallet. This is a, a, an M-Pesa wallet. It's, it's like a digital wallet on your SIM card, on your phone, okay. that can hold uh, digital Kenya shillings. Okay. Um, and these guys are great because they'd have uh, meetups. They'd have meetups at some of the, of the tech hubs in Nairobi. Uh, we started off as a really small community, mm -hmm. but you could feel there was a lot of energy. And it was pretty exciting to, to, to see this thing called Bitcoin that's going on globally uh -huh. and then see people in your, in your country building businesses out of it and then meet other people who are sort of excited by the same technology. 
Sure. So that was really great. And that kind of gave me the momentum to, to dig more into this. So I spent the rest of the year completely immersed in understanding this technology. I'd, I'd spend a lot of time on, uh, on Bitcoin talk, uh, on the forums. I'd spend a lot of time on Reddit. I'd watch a lot of videos. Uh, and I, I was fortunate enough to get a job uh, writing uh, Bitcoin price analysis articles for, for an exchange called uh, CEX.io. Uh, so, so I was able to pay for my bills. Uh, I'd, I'd get paid in Bitcoin and convert it to penny shillings. I'd pay for my bills, just the bare essentials. Right. And then I'd spend the rest of my 17 hours just, uh, just watching Andreas and just uh, reading back through forums and, you know, just trying to convince myself that, wow, there's, there's something really going on here. Right. Um, and slowly I just, uh, we sort of, the community, we got together and we decided we needed to grow this message beyond uh, the small meetups that we had. Uh, and we set up a nonprofit called uh, the African Digital Currency Association. Okay. And uh, we started doing more formal meetups. Uh, we set up online communities on Facebook and, was, and, uh, and WhatsApp. Uh, we also started putting out articles on the local publications. Basically, we started making noise and just making sure that that people understood there was this new fascinating thing that was going on, and uh-huh. uh, and anyone could get involved. Okay. And uh, yeah, so fast forward to to now, uh, I've just been more and more involved. It's been a rabbit hole. I've met so many people. I I founded a company in the space. I built a large community. Um, like it's just grown exponentially, even more than I could have imagined. Uh-huh. And right now, I just find myself in a situation where uh, this is probably what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Okay, interesting. So yeah. when you you said you started a company, is that the Chama Pesa that you're referring to? So the first the first thing you realize when you get into Kenya was there was a really great opportunity to to build a business that allowed people to convert cryptocurrencies into local currency uh-huh. and local currency into cryptocurrency. Uh, the reason is in Kenya, everyone, almost every adult has a phone with okay. a SIM card that has a digital wallet. And on this digital wallet, people hold uh, a digital version of the Kenya shilling. That's the local currency. Okay. So you can, you can send someone digital Kenya shillings and they can send you back digital Kenya shillings. Okay. So what has happened is you could build a service that allowed someone to send you digital Kenya shillings and you could send them back cryptocurrency. Right. So that was the first company uh, my co-founder Matthew and I set up, just called the Marty Blockchain Limited. Mm-hmm. And uh, we did that for a year until... Uh, the banks uh, made it possible to do business. Now, oh wait, no, that's interesting. So, so wait, I have two questions yeah, yeah. for you because th- this is interesting to me because um, I was mm. curious about exchanges and how these the, those businesses. Are, uh, uh, well, I still am, but I was always nervous to the thought of making a product that does these these conversions, right? Because if you're de- if you're dealing with so much money and you get hacked. Right, that was always a, a worry. So, how did you deal with that? Was that was that always in the back of your mind? What if we lose so much money of our customers? Yeah, so that was definitely on our mind because, <clears throat> as we know, uh, the cryptocurrency industry is fraught with, with such incidences. So, the last thing you want to do is, is take custody of customers' funds and then lose them. Uh-huh. Um, so, we well, sort of had. That? How did you exactly so, yourself? Yeah, sorry. Exactly. So we, we didn't exactly run an exchange. You know, an exchange is, is, is like a service where you, can, you have an account and you can have some Bitcoins or some Ethereum or some Ethereum Classic. Uh-huh. But in Kenya, what we did, we, we just acted as a, as, a, as a gateway. Yeah. So we never really took custody of anyone's funds. So okay. if you are someone who was interested in buying Bitcoin, you'd come to our service and log in and uh-huh. say, 
I want to buy 0 0.5 Bitcoin. And then uh, the service will ask you to send M-Pesa, digital Kenya shillings, to, okay. a certain, to a certain number. And as soon as you confirmed uh, receipt of payment, would okay. send uh, Bitcoins or Ethereum to, to a wallet address that you gave us. So it was basically just a gateway to provide access to cryptocurrencies. We didn't really take any custody. Yeah. Okay. I don't well, know but if you, well, you still had to receive uh, funds, right? And you still had to have a, a large uh, right account of funds. So you were, you were still moving lots of money, right? In and out? Exactly. So this is where the bank story comes in. Uh, because okay. in Kenya, we sort of, one of the problems with, with cryptocurrencies in the African markets is there's not enough liquidity. Like we don't have people who are mining cryptocurrencies here. Okay. A, a lot of the cryptocurrencies are, are trading on, on the foreign exchanges. If it's uh -huh. in China, if it's in, in, in Kraken in Europe, if it's uh, in, on Coinbase in the US. So we, what we did, we, we connected this market. So we had like a corporate account with, with a lot of these exchanges and then it balanced. So if someone made an order, it was hooked up to an API okay. that would transfer Bitcoins to this address. And we had a way to receive. We used M-Pesa to receive uh, funds from our customers. Uh -huh. But every once in a while, we had to top up our corporate exchange with dollars. And that's where the bank came in. Because we had a lot of money moving out from our corporate bank account okay. to, to a bank account that belongs to it an exchange like coinbase or kraken okay so they yeah. they they can they can censor different companies or if they decide they don't like what you're doing uh they they can just say sorry we're not going to allow that and you're at their mercy basically yes so there's there's two parts to this uh so the central bank of kenya a year, a year before we got into business the central bank of kenya which is the the banking regulator had, had sent out a notice telling all banks that they should not work with any virtual currency businesses. So if you are remotely considered as a, as a, as a virtual currency business, then it was the bank would call you in and tell you, you're sorry, we can't take your business. And they actually ex escalated that to the point where they would flag any transactions that were going to the major exchanges. If it's okay. Bitstamp, if it's uh -huh. Coinbase, if it's Kraken. So that's how they, they made it impossible. And even now, they make it impossible to, okay. to send to wire fiat currency into exchanges. Okay. Yeah, so yeah I that was why that was, I... Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. You had, you had something yeah. else? So, so that was the first part, yeah? The okay. second bit of this was... Because we were using M-Pesa, which is like a private company to okay. accept payments from our, com from our, from our customers, okay. this company was also anti-Bitcoin. It, it still is, actually. So okay. what they did, they said, we are also not going to work with any companies that deal in virtual currencies. So okay. basically, there's no way to accept fiat currency from our customers using the payment channels that we have available in our country. This is okay. M-Pesa, banks. Uh, yeah. So, so M-Pesa, you, you, you made the distinction. So M-Pesa is, you said is not a, a cryptocurrency. And I, I uh, can you kind of text, say, describe a little bit the difference between M-Pesa and BitPesa? So basically, in Nairobi, we have um, mobile phones really took off in the early 2000s, and almost every adult in Kenya and East Africa has a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. And these mobile phones have what's called a SIM card. Yeah? Uh, mm -hmm. And this SIM card is, is what your network provider gives you. Just like in the United States, you guys have uh, Verizon, you have right. uh, AT&T. So here we have, we have Safaricom. And we have Airtel and we have uh, Orange. So these are like the telecommunication companies. Huh. And what they did 
they realized there was an opportunity to allow people to send money between each other mm-hmm. by creating what's called a mobile money network. Okay. So how this works is you walk up to someone called an agent and this agent is, is works for one of the large telecommunication companies. Mm-hmm. And you tell this agent, I'd like to make a deposit on my mobile phone. And they tell you, okay, how much do you like to deposit? You tell them a thousand Kenyan shillings and you hand over 1000 in cash. Okay. And because, and because they work for the telecommunication company, what they'll do, they will top up your phone with 1000 Kenya shillings worth of digital money. Okay. Yeah? So, mm-hmm. so you hand them 1000, you get 1000 in your phone. Right. Once you have this 1000 in your phone, you can store it, you can save it on your phone mm-hmm. or you can send it to someone else as a remittance. Okay. Or, or you can make a bill payment. You can pay for electricity, mm-hmm. or uh, you can even pay some merchants who are willing to accept it. Okay. And anyone who receives this money, if they need to go back into cash, all they need to do is walk up to an agent mm-hmm. and say, "I'd like to make a withdrawal," and they'll send that one thousand Kenya shillings to the agent, mm-hmm. and the agent will hand them back cash. So. That's that's in person in a nutshell. Okay, so it is it cur- so instead of going into a traditional bank building, you basically meet an agent somewhere. I assume that they don't have to have a building, and they probably don't most of the time. So it's like a mobile bank service, right? That you meet in public places. Is that do I understand it correctly? Absolutely. These are like. Uh... It's like a small kiosk. It's it's not as big as a branch. It's it's really small, and mm-hmm. and even some of the some of the shops that we have around, mm-hmm. they can be agents. So oh, almost, okay. Almost anyone can be an agent. You can just walk into a shop and you find out that the shopkeeper, uh, alongside running his business, also serves as as a as an impressa agent. There's I like see. about one hundred and fifty thousand of these agents across Kenya. So okay. yes. Yeah, this right. is happens completely outside the, the banking system. And then, how does a uh, Bitcoin? Excuse me, not Bitcoin. How does BitPesa? How is it similar and different now than this M-Pesa network? So, so BitPesa is is a service that plugs into M-Pesa. Yeah? Okay. So, okay. so, so it plugs into M-Pesa with with like APIs and a gateway. So, what okay. they do is they allow you to send. And pesa to them, so you can send them in pesa digital Kenya shillings, uh-huh. and they can send you cryptocurrency wherever you want them to send. If okay. that's a, a that's an address, for example, uh-huh. and you can also revert a transaction. If you have if you have bitcoins and you want Kenya shillings, okay. you can send bitcoins to this service called Bitpesa, uh-huh. and they'll send you Kenya shillings to your Mpesa wallet. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so that's the difference between Bitpesa. Bitpesa does M-Pesa uh-huh. to, to cryptocurrency, and M-Pesa does uh, cash to uh, digital Kenya shillings. Oh, okay. So it's it's just an additional service that may or may not involve M-Pesa, but it's more cryptocurrency friendly, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. And and anyone can do this. Anyone can build on top of M-Pesa. So Bitpesa is one of the services that is built on top of M-Pesa. Okay. And you, but you also said that that M-Pesa that is not very supportive of cryptocurrency. So does that mean that they don't like Bitpesa? Yes. So so this is what happened. This is what happened. Uh, okay. Uh, M-Pesa wasn't too friendly to Bitcoin, and uh-huh. uh, first thing they did is. Is they told me they shut down Bitpesa as a service. They told Bitpesa, you can no longer use our Mpesa platform to allow Kenyans to make payments intended to buy or, or selling cryptocurrency. Uh-huh. And Bit, Bitpesa was the second company that actually received this notice. Okay. The first company was uh, was Kipochi. Okay. A year earlier. And we too run into the same problem. So no one, no one right now in Kenya can build a business, a cryptocurrency business that connects to Mpesa, okay. that allows one to convert between cryptocurrency and, and Kenya shillings. 
Oh, so so wait, so so BitPesa still exists. They still survive. They just can't use M-Pesa. Is, is that what you're saying? Yes, absolutely. That's, okay, so they can't. They could. They can still convert fiat currency like your shillings to Bitcoin, though. That that's still available as a service, correct? Yes, they can still do that. They okay. Still do that. I see. Okay. And so both of those together are competition for the banks, whether it's M-Pesa or BitPesa, they both happen out, right? You meet people, like you said, different shops can support one or both M-Pesa and BitPesa. Is that right? Uh, not necessarily because BitPesa does not allow people to convert cash to Bitcoins. They, they would have to go out there and, and build their own agent network. So what they do is they just rely on someone who has already built a service to convert cash to mobile digital Kenya shillings. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sort of like, uh, like, uh, like PayPal and then all these companies build on top of PayPal. Okay. Oh, but I thought, I, but I thought you said that the, the, the M-Pesa didn't, wouldn't allow BitPesa to use the, the digital shillings, right? Digital shillings yes. is M-Pesa, right? So there's other digital shillings besides that. M-Pesa is oh, the Oh, there's other ones. The okay, dominant. gotcha. There's I see. Other ones. Yeah, there's okay. a couple of them. Yeah. Okay, so they just, you, there's a competitor to M-Pesa that BitPesa's, BitPesa uses instead. Okay, I understand now. All right. Yeah, yeah now, uh, what I heard from a, a Kenyan when I was in Dubai, I think it was over a year ago, was how before these other choices, the banks had real, the, I don't know if there was one bank or if they had a monopoly, but they, they just really were corrupt and they had really terrible service. And these, 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 these other alternate choices, she was telling me, uh, the, the, the woman that I was talking to, she said that these, these services just real, changed Kenya so dramatically because then after they had competition the banks started providing better service they lowering their fees can you talk about that did i understand that correctly yeah you did uh, that is why uh, most people when they hear about kenya they know about uh, mpesa and they also know about the safaris in kenya but uh-huh. mpesa is really a huge phenomenon because it created a service that did not exist before uh-huh. And it created a, a payment platform that what, that was separate from from the banking system. Uh-huh. So, a long time ago, the only way people could access financial services was to go to a bank branch, and there weren't many bank branches. The banks were really strict on what you needed to open an account. Uh-huh. They they you needed a high minimum balance. So so what happened is once the mobile phone took off. Uh, and this mobile phone, the network providers were the telecommunication companies I mentioned earlier. They they created a digital wallet within the mobile phone right. that you could use to store some amount of money. Yeah. So so all of a sudden, you didn't have to go to a bank branch to get a service that could help you store money and send it to someone else. Okay. You, you could just walk to an agent, hand them one thousand Kenya shillings in cash. They could top up your phone uh-huh. with, with digital 1,000 digital Kenya shillings, and you could send this to a friend somewhere or to family in the rural areas. So right. you basically had a, 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 a simple banking service with, with some minimal banking service, like, like sending money to a friend or storing some amount of money uh-huh. or, or making payments. You could make a payment with, with that money. Uh, the difference between the this kind of wallet and the bank was there was low KYC requirements. So all you needed was was your was your national identity card. Uh-huh. And once you had your national identity card, you could instantly start using this service. So right. this made several services that are not previously available before to a large unbanked population available to anyone with a mobile phone. You could send money, you could receive money, you could make remote payments, mm-hmm. and you could store some amount of money. 
Right. Now, now granted, it, it was you couldn't do this for a lot of money, but uh, you could do this for a decent amount of money. I, okay. You could do this for five hundred dollars, which is fifty thousand Kenya shillings. Okay. So, so, so that's how Mpesa started growing and became popular. More and more people started using it for for storing value, for making payments, and all of a sudden, close to to thirteen million people were using this service regularly uh-huh. for moving value around this network. And all this is happening outside the banks. The banks have totally no control of this. It's, it's happening outside their system. Right. It's happening on mobile phones. It's happening with, with agents. They don't even need bank branches to do this. Uh-huh. And it, it became a threat. It became a real threat. And if, if you read up on the story of Mpesa in Kenya, the banks were really pissed off. Uh, <laughs> well put. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like I was, I, I was reading an article where you were commenting on on a the, so the Ken, the the article that I saw on the web was with the Kenyan bankers were they they just made this really uh, 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 they misrepresented Bitcoin. They made a press release that said that it could be used as a conduit for terrorism and money laundering. So that's true. But then they also said that it was illegal. They, they, they tried to give Kenyans the impression that, that Bitcoin was, is, was illegal in Kenya. And I, I saw that you were commenting on that. And anyway, I just thought that that was kind of heavy handed for them to try to just send that misinformation out that they, it sounds like they were really desperate to destroy the use, usage of cryptocurrencies. You can see it. It's, it's the same thing they did with the Mpesa. Like, in fact, I see a lot of parallels between the Mpesa story in Kenya okay. and the Bitcoin story. Because uh-huh. when Mpesa grew so big and relevant, the banks would lobby and say, Mpesa will be used as a conduit for terrorist funding. Oh, right. Mpesa should be controlled. Uh, Mpesa is not regulated. You know, like uh-huh. all the same. All the same. All the same arguments I see bankers make about Bitcoin. <laughs> the same arguments that bankers were making about M-Pesa. Right. Know? Yeah. And so so do you, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So, so uh, that's why the Bitcoin story, I really connected with it because I could see some similarities between how a simple technology in Kenya had completely changed the financial system in Kenya. And then I'm seeing the same thing happen with Bitcoin, and I'm seeing bankers make the same argument. So <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was really convinced that there's something going on here. Right, right. Now, do do you think that uh, Bitcoin and and other cryptocurrencies will slowly replace M-Pesa more and more? Is there a reason that people choose one or the other? So, I think. Uh, the thing that a lot of outsiders not understand about, so I see outsiders make a lot of comments about, uh, and this is from from Reddit, from watching videos, from uh, Bitcoin talk forums, and they always say uh, cryptocurrency can replace uh, African currencies because African currencies are so volatile, and uh-huh. that includes Kenya. Uh, sometimes outsiders say cryptocurrencies will replace M-Pesa, uh-huh. But I think people don't understand that M-Pesa is actually a pretty useful tool uh-huh. within within the boundaries of Kenya. So if you want to send money to someone within Kenya, someone who's in Kenya, who has a, a mobile phone in Kenya and has a cellular network based in Kenya, uh-huh. M-Pesa is your easiest way to send money. Uh, okay. I've used the cryptocurrencies for a long time, and mm-hmm. I can tell you there's no easier way to send money to someone else within Kenya than uh-huh. using M-Pesa. Okay. So M-Pesa is pretty useful within the boundaries of Kenya. Okay. Where I see where I see cryptocurrencies fitting in is connecting Kenya and the rest of the world. Yeah? Uh-huh. So connecting Kenya with, with another country or connecting Kenya with, with a virtual world. So anywhere where you have to cross like a border, whether it's a physical border or a geographical border, okay. because or a virtual border because because the payment systems that exist out there like Visa and PayPal and uh-huh. Skrill 
and MasterCard, like they're really broken. They don't really work for us as okay. Africans. Yeah, they're very discriminative. Okay. You know? Like and what? They cost I, a lot. So I'm they curious. cost a lot of money. Yeah. So so they yeah. they they cost a lot. And what did you mean by discriminating? Like they they certain countries they don't, or, or how are they discriminating? They're discriminating. For example. They don't work in certain countries. Oh, okay. Uh, like PayPal, for example, just uh, banned the whole of Nigeria from using their service. Yeah. Okay. They also they are also discriminative in the way that they ask us for some things. So if I need to use PayPal, for example, or or if I need to use an online money wallet, I need to give them some certain information about myself. Right. And sometimes the information they ask for is not information that we have here in our country. You know, like here, we don't have street addresses. We okay. don't have zip codes. Yeah, okay. we don't have, uh, you know, like, like it's, it's built from a very Western-centric point of view. So they'll ask right. us for some things. And if you can't provide that, then your funds get frozen, you know? Right. There's no consumer protection. I see. Know? It's just it not compatible. Right. To get frozen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it, it's... It, okay, I, I understand now. So that they just don't understand the the Kenyan market, some of the African countries, their their needs and requirements. So yeah, when you, it, it was interesting because when you started saying that Kenyans like M-Pesa and they're happy with it, and it's a very fast and convenient system, I thought, oh my my goodness, maybe there's no reason to use an alternative. But then you you answered that question. So the, the alternatives like Bitcoin and Ethereum are necessary when you interact with the rest of the world, right? Because the rest of the world doesn't use or necessarily understand M-Pesa. So that made sense that you would need cryptocurrencies uh, when you leave Kenya or communicate with outside entities, right? Absolutely. I, I, see, I see cryptocurrencies as a common universal language that we can connect to and communicate to the rest of the world. And this could be in form of uh, online payments. It could be making remittances. So anywhere where this value moving from Kenya to, 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 to the virtual world or, or value moving from the virtual world into Kenya or right. money moving from one geographical area from Kenya to another geographical area or money moving from a different geographical area into Kenya. So and Pesa and and cryptocurrencies and, and some of the other services that we have that are similar to M-Pesa, they would fit, they're so perfect. They would fit so well with, mm -hmm. with cryptocurrencies. And a lot of times I feel I'm always like, I'm, I'm always hoping cryptocurrencies take off as a major means of value exchange online mm -hmm. because that's going to be really huge for us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's almost as if I'm I'm saying I'm saying to the cryptocurrency industry like, come on guys, just make this work, you know, like give us more cryptocurrency. Right. <laughs> the more the better. Pay. Exactly, you know, like <laughs> where can I pay using cryptocurrency? Where can I get paid using cryptocurrencies? You know, because right. then the young people here who are all on their smartphones, who are working online, who are, are placing bets online, who are, you know, they're just interacting with the virtual economy right they, they'll have now they now have a reason to actually use bitcoin and cryptocurrencies right. yes yeah yeah so i have to i have to admit that I, I never would have known that you said how these some services like paypal and visa that sometimes they require information that some countries don't have like a zip code address uh so i thought that was interesting that that, that never would have occurred to me i wouldn't have known I, I just would have assumed that maybe you could they, that they could have some equivalent of an address the in Kenya or in every country, but I guess that's not the case. No, 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 it's not. That's uh, yeah, that's that's one of the huge problems. It even affects uh, e-commerce. But yes, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. So so then, and I I think I already know the answer to this, but I'll ask it anyway. So. So what you're saying is that cryptocurrencies are much easier for different cultures, different countries to be able to use. They don't have these incompatibilities like the the existing systems do, right? Yeah, they, they don't have incompatibilities. 
they don't have these these demands or these requirements it's it's almost like it's a very frictionless frictionless uh, uh, network right. it's a frictionless service that just has the bare minimums right. and if you see this is one of the reasons why there's been a lot of adoption in Kenya uh -huh. in terms of people accessing it because there, there's really no barrier if if you think you like cryptocurrency you want to get yourself some uh -huh. someone's gonna you're gonna find a community who are already doing this right yeah. it's gonna be very easy for you to get started yeah. okay yes interesting all right so um is there any so m pesa is exciting bit pesa and how that's um an additional choice uh, uh involving cryptocurrencies that's exciting are there any other exciting interesting cryptocurrency blockchain related initiatives in africa that you want to talk about so actually there's they, they, there are a lot there are, there are a lot of them there's there's one called uh pesa base so uh -huh. so Pe pesa base is uh uses uh ethereum and uh and bitcoin for for cross border remittances from okay. from sudan to australia so uh, so south sudan is like a a country that neighbors kenya uh, uh -huh. it's within our region okay. and it turns out there are a lot of of immigrants in in australia who okay. are from south sudan so so they provide a service they allow people to move money between australia and uh, and south sudan uh -huh. another interesting company is, is tanjalo which is in uh, in nigeria it's, it's it's by a friend of mine uh who goes by the name team tanjalo tanjalo is is a nigerian bitcoin exchange so they allow you to convert your nigerian naira into into bitcoins and vice uh, versa okay uh, there, there are also some friends of mine in zimbabwe who run an exchange called uh golix okay uh, and that's the same thing so a lot of the earliest a lot of the earliest startups that i'm seeing in in africa they're basically mm -hmm. trying to to like get some liquidity going on you know like uh, right how can we get africans to at least access this 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 markets yeah right. and this this are the, the earliest companies uh -huh. um i would say chamapesa chamapesa is which is the, the startup i'm working with uh, yes we're not, we're not really a cryptocurrency company but we are using blockchain technology uh -huh. for for what are called uh, social savings groups in okay. africa okay so let me start back a bit and say remember earlier when i talked about how uh Kenyans what want to get in bank like the banks wouldn't have them and these right. people are basically on banks yeah yes but there's a subtle there's a subtle detail that's always left out of that narrative is that even though people never had bank accounts people came up with this creative way of of serving themselves with with financial services so okay like if it's a group of villagers or a group of friends or a group of business people they'd come together they come together into groups of like 10 to 30 people okay yeah. and mm -hmm. and what and what they do is uh they pull savings together so they meet every month or periodically and put savings together into a pool and mm -hmm. everyone gets shares into this in this pool of savings uh -huh. uh, and some of the members if, if someone has a pressing need within the group they can borrow money from from okay. within the group from this part of pool mm -hmm. and they can pay back this this loan using a favorable interest rates right so, so it's so it's like a, they're making an informal bank almost exactly exactly absolutely so this turns out this was also a really big phenomenon because this is what this is how people were surviving and it's become embedded in culture and there's like a million of this there's a million we call them charmers okay. and there's a million charmers okay that do these functions they save together they invest together they give out loans within each other so but the trouble is they do the accounting on on paper ledger so all the accounting is done on papers and booklets okay. uh -huh. yeah uh -huh. uh, and what chama pesa is doing is uh is approaching all these individual charmers and giving them a blockchain app that they can use to keep the accounting records so each of these charmers can have their own sort of small i see group blockchain 
yeah yeah where all the information is private within the group now okay. if, if they if they need to to connect with another group let's say one group may want to invest in another group or one group may want to lend money to another group uh -huh. using a blockchain they're going to use a public blockchain to connect all these chama so chama pesa is we call it a, a ledger app for social savings groups right. in africa yeah, see, that's I can. So, so your Chama Pesa initiative is supporting these informal banks, and it's interesting and it's perfect that you're using blockchains, right? A, a blockchain solution because the one of the main selling points of blockchains is you could trust that information when it's stored on a on a public blockchain. It's not going to be tampered with. It can't be modified. So, I, I could see why that would be helpful not just because it's more convenient and accessible than a ledger, but also that it's, you can trust it. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's interesting. Um, yeah, that's, um, so I thought it was, so it's, I heard that there was a, a large number of unbanked in the world. So it's interesting to hear um, your, your description of how blockchains have helped those people. I also heard that remittances were there, there's a, a globally there's a huge amount of funds that are in, that are transferred right that are remittances like for example like you said from Af from Australia to Africa so it, though those the re, those need being able to help improve those parts of the economy are are really huge right being able to use blockchains to streamline those. The, to help the unbanked and to help with remittances, that that's really a big deal, right? Even though it, I, that's not something that I often do remittances and deal with unbanked, but that world globally, that's a big deal to help a lot of people. Is that correct? It is. It is. Uh, remittances are a very crucial part of a lot of of African countries. Like, uh -huh. uh, like Nigeria gets about uh, twenty five, close to twenty five billion dollars annually. Okay. Uh, uh, Kenya gets about uh, Kenya gets about three three billion dollars uh -huh. annually, and and the diaspora the Kenyan diaspora is in countries like the United States. It's mostly in in North America, in Canada, uh -huh. and the United States, and the United Kingdom, and we are so dependent for a long time. We've been so dependent on on Western corporations like Western Union and MoneyGram. And, uh -huh. and even PayPal. So I would see that's a very good area where cryptocurrencies could offer real value in, in reducing some of the costs that are involved in uh, in moving money from such countries into Kenya and also in allowing local companies to get into that space. Because what I like about Bitcoin is Bitcoin doesn't come with any rules. So. Uh -huh. So anyone in Kenya who has the capacity can build a business that allows people to move money from another country into Kenya. Like right. we really don't have to depend on on a country that's located in a completely different juris jurisdiction, that's paying taxes in a different jurisdiction. Right. I think Bitcoin gives gives Africans a chance to to build this this global businesses that can move money. Right. Yeah. So I, I think you're touching upon one of the things you're you're touching upon is how these cryptocurrencies are decentralized. So the, the power is 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 spread out, is distributed. So people in Kenya that want to be involved, they, they, they could have control, they could have power and start a business and be involved without having to depend on a centralized uh, service. Right. That that might not be do that might not serve all the customers needs absolutely it's it's very similar to the the great internet story that's happening right now in africa in okay. east africa where services access it goes everyone has an android phone uh you can easily access services like like whatsapp and and, and you can start using these services like whatsapp to sell things and do business so uh -huh. i find that the, the technologies that are that are decentralized, the technologies that are open to use, technologies that they don't come with barriers, technologies that are not proprietary, they have a very good chance of succeeding in, in markets like ours because they really make it possible for, 
or just about anyone to, right to apply them for their specific aspiration yeah right right I, I i i agree i'm a big fan of open source and decentralized technologies also um yes very good so all right i think you've given us a good idea of the past and present do you want to have share your thoughts what do you think is going to happen in the future uh regarding africa and cryptocurrencies and banking you have any thoughts on on what's going to transpire uh, so what's been happening is the the whole blockchain wave that you and i both know like uh, and some of our listeners listeners like blockchains are becoming more popular. Every, everyone is talking about it. It's, it's really yeah. hard to avoid this conversation on cryptocurrencies. And I like that. I like that because it's, it's putting pressure on, 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 on the people in our country who want us to take it slow. You know, like how the central bank comes in and says, uh, let's wait and see, you know, uh, right. you're warned about these virtual currencies. But the more it's taking off in the rest of the world, mm -hmm. and and our people, our people are connected to the internet. They can see what's happening online. They can see that Bitcoin is actually a very legitimate thing. It's it's not a scam like like the central the central bank governor would have us believe. Right. So 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 that's really play, putting pressure on on people locally, mm -hmm. on on, on, on uh, the central authorities locally. But it's also creating hype. A lot of people now are getting interested. Uh -huh. In fact, since since 2013, yeah, uh -huh. the volumes the volumes on local bitcoins have gone up from 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 10,000 Kenya shillings per week okay. to, to to 100 million per week. Oh my goodness. Right now, uh -huh. so so going forward, I'm expecting more and more people are going to be buying and taking part. In this new cryptocurrency economy and right. i think a lot of the young people right now this we have a huge generation of young people who are coming up who've been born into an era of of low-cost smartphones like right you, you just need 30 dollars to get a smartphone and start taking part in the internet economy so i see a lot of young people especially mm -hmm. in kenya are going to be the first ones to get involved with cryptocurrencies yeah and this could be in the form of a of blogging for cryptocurrencies or or content or or freelancing or or, right. or even crypto kitties you know right. like yeah. Uh -huh. yeah you know they're just like millennials all over the world you know and they get excited by, by right this. so i'm expecting a lot of young people uh to get involved i'm expecting more volumes uh -huh. i'm expecting more businesses that there are going to be more businesses that are going to use this technology and you can already see it happening Right now, there's there's close to ten startups that are working on blockchain uh -huh. uh, and cryptocurrency related All right. technologies in Kenya. W yeah, would you so... be okay? Uh -huh. w would you be so uh, bold as to predict that the banks will be traditional banks would are eventually going to be uh, eliminated completely in Africa? But banks. Think? So here's what I'm gonna so. Here's what I'll say. You remember the story I told you about M-Pesa and how M-Pesa really threatened the banks. Right. They sort of got a lesson in never dismiss any technology. Don't dismiss technology. The technology can really threaten your, your incumbent models, your business models, your old business legacy models. Uh -huh. So I'm actually seeing a situation where banks are going to be very accepting of, of something like Bitcoin. And okay. and that's, that's Kenyan banks because Kenyan banks they got a hard lesson in ignoring something powerful, yeah? right? Okay. And right now, because of, because Mpesa already is said they don't want to work with cryptocurrencies for now. It's mm -hmm. it's really an open field, and I think all of them are watching. It. I wouldn't be surprised to see banks in Kenya adopt this technology. Yeah? Okay. Oh, so the, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. interesting. So they might embrace it instead of keep instead of keeping trying to keep fighting. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, they might not have a choice, right? If they want to survive, they're they're going to be forced maybe to embrace these these cryptocurrencies. Yeah, and and mostly because they this it's like they're relieving what already happened. The patterns are the same. You know, something new comes up, it, 
it completely happens outside your your system so they already have got a tough lesson in how how technology can right start your your legacy business models so right. i can't speak for other banks in other countries but in kenya particularly the banks are very much aware since since mpesa they've been very tech friendly they they're always out there trying to incorporate technology there right they've really had to adapt and, and change their business models right right yeah. yes competition is a good thing so always. yes. Oh, right. so so good. I think it's it's been very interesting, and we've covered a lot of ground. Before we end the show, is there any other uh, comments or anything else you want to touch upon? Uh, I, I I just I just uh, I would just like to say I think Chamapesa is okay. is going to be a very great project. Okay. Uh, because it's. I think there's a lot of lessons that the cryptocurrency industry can learn from, from what I described as charmers, because charmers are sort of informal banks. They are, it's it's like a community bank that happens outside the formal economy, outside the formal banking institutions. Right. And if you look at the cryptocurrency industry right now, it, it's it's kind of in the same position. You know, it's 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 acting outside. All the regulated systems and, and the traditional financial system. Oh, that's so, like interesting. Yes, you're right. It's like so the cryptocurrencies and the, some of the services is like like an informal bank, like the chamas that you have in Kenya. Exactly. So, I, so I think the cryptocurrency industry can learn a lot from Kenyan chamas on how people can can, can organize themselves into communities and uh, bank themselves. You know, I, right? I, I think this is a really powerful story. There. This is like. Ex- this is actually one of the things Chama Pesa we are trying to do is export this concept, this concept of people coming together into communities and finding a way to bank themselves outside the banking system. I think the Bitcoin community could learn a lot. The cryptocurrency community could learn a lot from, right. from this Chama. Yeah. Interesting. So I'll, yeah, I'll definitely put a link in the description uh, to, to your, the Chama Pesa initiative that you're involved with. So yeah, that would, people want to, find out more or contact Mick, you could, uh, you could get a hold of him through, through the description. You'll see the information there. So, um, yes. So, wow. Thank, thank you so much, uh, for the people listening. I wanted to give you guys, uh, some information about how blockchain is really making a, a real difference in real people's lives all over the world. I know I'm a nerd and sometimes blockchains to me are just fun and games. Um, but I, I wanted to, to show you that there, there's real problems that, that are being solved with cryptocurrency. And I think you've, you've enlightened us, Mick. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. If, and uh, good luck with all your initiatives and trying to improve the lives of, of Kenyans, Africans. And I wish you the best of luck. Thanks. Uh, let's catch up in, in a year or two and see where we are at. Yes, definitely. Yes, we'll keep in touch. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.